Okay, welcome back. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were welcome back. Just before we went for our break, we were um, looking as uh, at God as King who is to be feared and and honored. We're on page number sixteen, and we said that one of the greatest tributes to God as King came from a pagan king, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, and um, we see that. You know, he established a powerful empire, Babylonian empire. It was, you know, it was a great king, but uh, he lost his mind and uh, he became like an animal living in the forest. But once he had gone through that time of his life, God ultimately restored him. And, um, you know, he turned back to God. And we see that he extols or he ascribes uh, greatness to the king of all kings. And look at what he says in Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. Can somebody read Daniel chapter 4, verse 34? It's in your notes. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever for his and his kingdom is from generation to generation his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is a gen is from generation to generation amen so you see this king who did not know about the true and living god finally encounters him recognizes that his kingdom will never pass okay and um, this king of this kingdom will also never pass and his kingdom will never pass. And he says his dominion is from everlasting to everlasting. Can somebody else read verse 35, please, of the same chapter? All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Amen. Thank you, Lucy. So here King Nebuchadnezzar realizes that even though I am a king of a powerful empire, yet I have my own limitations. But there is this king, the king of heaven and earth, who is infinitely greater than me. And there is no one who can stop him, stop his path, stop his ways, no one who can contend with him. And so what he says, he says, I must ascribe greatness to this king. So in the light of God's greatness, King Nebuchadnezzar understands his own frailty, his own weakness. Can somebody else please read verses 36 and 37, please? So, chapter. At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My adversaries and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Amen. Why is he saying that? Uh, all his ways are just and those who walk in pride is able to put down. Why does he say that? Yeah, he was in that situation. Okay. He was filled with pride and God, you know, had to uh, teach him. And so he says his ways are just. Okay. And so he says, I now realize that there is a thing greater than me. I'm not I am. I'm not the greatest king on this earth. There is a king greater than me and I want to worship this king. So that is what we also need to come to a realization, right? That there is this greater king who is much greater, who is much bigger, much more powerful. And you know that I need that king, okay? I need that king. That king longs for me. He longs for relationship, companionship, fellowship. And, you know, I need to worship this king. So our king needs to be feared and honored. 
And we see this also spoken in many other uh, verses in the Bible. Paul writing to young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, he says, Now to the king, immortal, uh, invisible, eternal God, he alone is wise, and to him belongs all glory and honor forever and ever. And in the same uh, letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, he says, which he will manifest in his own time, he who is blessed and only potentent, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. So the several places where in scripture we read that God is King of kings and Lord of lords. So just want to encourage you that when you worship God, when you go into his house, when you go into his presence, knowing that you are entering the King of kings, the Lord of lords, what should your attitude be? you know, even as you worship and how you need to pray, okay? The second thing that I said we will look at in chapter 2 is we'll see how Jesus introduced this kingdom here on earth, or Jesus, how did Jesus reintroduce the kingdom of God here on this earth, okay? So when the Lord Jesus came to this world, uh, how did he go about introducing the kingdom of God? What did he do? Yeah, he taught the parables, okay? What else? To science, wonders, and miracles, okay? Anything else? Healing, okay? Why is it important for us to, to see how Jesus reintroduced the kingdom here on earth? Why is it important for us to understand that? Yes, that is how we will also operate. That is also how we will approach this kingdom uh, and how we also will be able to establish that kingdom here on earth. And what aspect of the kingdom of God we are looking at? Or what aspect of the kingdom of God are we presently in? Or which dimension of the kingdom of God are we presently in? The spiritual aspect, right? Yes. There is a natural dimension and the spiritual, yes. So the spiritual is what we are seeing and experiencing now. The natural will come when? The second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay, when he comes and establishes his literal kingdom. Okay, so now we're talking about the spiritual aspect of the kingdom. Where is the kingdom of God? Where is the kingdom of God? In us. And through us, the kingdom of God is extended to our environment or the place that God has planted us. Okay, So you and I are responsible to extend the spiritual kingdom uh, even as we adapt the same methodology or the same method just Jesus took to reintroduce his kingdom. Okay, So we see that uh, John the Baptist had the greatest privilege of being the John the Baptist was who? Forerunner of Jesus. The one who heralded the coming of the Messiah or the coming of the king and his kingdom. Okay. Uh, he said in Matthew chapter 3 verse 2. Can somebody read that? Matthew chapter 3 verse 2. And saying, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at mm -hmm. hand. Okay, so we see that uh, John the Baptist had this unique privilege of all the Old Testament prophets to be the immediate forerunner of Jesus Christ. Okay, and in the light of this, see what Jesus said in Luke chapter 7, verse 28. It's there in your notes in the textbook on page number 18, top of page number 18. Can somebody read that, please? Somebody else who's not read? Come on, Diksha, quick. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also because... No, my dear, we are on top of page number 18. It's, okay. Top of page number 18, Luke chapter 7. You can give it to him, he can read it in the meantime. Give it here, give it here. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is no not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, 
but he who is least in the kingdom of god is greater greater than he amen so what is jesus saying here about john the baptist of all those who are born of women there is no greater prophet than john the baptist so who's the greatest prophet not even elijah not even elisha but john the baptist and what does it say also why does uh, he say that he was he ha, he's the greatest of all the old testament prophets why is john the baptist greatest of all the old testament prophets come on what did john the baptist do he's a forerunner of jesus christ don't be scared to answer you can it's okay if it's wrong uh, this is not school we're not going to punish you <laughs> okay so you can just go ahead and say even if it's a wrong answer never mind don't worry okay so there's no greater prophet than john the baptist okay so he's the greatest of all old testament prophets because he had this unique privilege of announcing the king his coming and that king is in, going to reintroduce the kingdom of god but yet what does jesus say about john the baptist what does jesus say about john the baptist look at your look at verse 28 he says he but he who is least, least in the kingdom of god is greater than he amen can anyone how many of you have read this verse before hands up asapu you've not read gospels <laughs> diksha i've not read the gospels okay so you've read this before what does it mean have you ever wondered what jesus meant by this were you excited when you read this verse or you just read it are you excited why vimal take the mic and speak it's okay even if it's wrong doesn't matter just speak like uh, we are the least we didn't did the work of god hmm. but we have the privilege and we have the grace and we directly call to be a son of god and we are the part of his kingdom okay good so even the least person in the kingdom of god least means what last okay it was considered last means we 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 won't qualify that we won't go there but who is the least in the kingdom of god is even greater than john that means if you're greater than john you're even greater than elijah elisha samuel who is also a prophet moses who was also prophet you're greater than all of these why is jesus saying this why even though we did not do any of the great miracles why is jesus saying this have you ever thought okay anyone on online students any thoughts on this i think uh, what 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 uh, jesus is trying to say that we, you know it's not about uh, how how big we are how how great we are it's the simplest of simple people uh you know uh, uh in the kingdom of god are higher i don't know i think so okay thank you warren for trying sister i think because we are born into the spiritual kingdom okay good get truth so here it says that even though john the baptist introduced the king and the kingdom of god he could not enter the kingdom of god why he could not inherit the kingdom of god he could not enter the kingdom of god okay died on the cross okay no one could be born again till jesus died on the cross and resurrected yes thank you sanjay so here it says that you know uh, he was not born uh, no one could be even born again because jesus had not yet died and rose again so he, um, he could not enter the kingdom of god and who enters the kingdom of god what does jesus say 
unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says that to Nicodemus, right? Okay, so he could not be born again because Jesus had not yet died and John the Baptist died before that. Okay, so he could not see the kingdom of God um, uh, until, you know, Jesus died and rose again. So today you and I are much more privileged people because we are born again and, uh, you know, we are born into the kingdom of God. We are inheritors of the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is inside us, okay? And we are part of the spiritual aspect of the kingdom and he rules and reigns in and through us. And this is a wonderful privilege. This is a rare privilege. And that's why he says those who are even least in the kingdom of God are greater than all the greatest Old Testament prophets and even greater than John the Baptist. Okay. So you see how privileged you and I are. Privileged that even the people in the Old Testament, because even though the people in the Old Testament had the laws, the commands, the prophets, the covenants, you know, everything, um, theirs were the forefathers. But yet we have the new covenant, which is much greater than the old covenant. Amen. Right. And we have the privilege of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us forever. Okay. So we are in the kingdom and the kingdom of God is in us. And we need to discover the different aspects of how Jesus ministered in the kingdom so that we can also, the different facets so that we can also minister and we can also see that uh, this, and we also discover the hidden treasures that is in us so that we can, you know, be effective people who are expanding his kingdom here on earth. So that is what we want to do in this series, even as we talk about the kingdom of God, how we can, you know, further discover the treasures in the kingdom and how we can be effective in the kingdom of God. Yes, you have a question? Can please you take the mic? Uh, just a little out of context, but uh, how are the people in the Old Testament saved? So, How are the people in the Old Testament saved? Born again. So God had his laws, the commands, the sacrifices they were saved through that. They were, they were justified. They were, um, uh, their sins were atoned for by keeping the law, by making those sacrifices that God instituted. So everything in the Old Testament, all of the laws, all of the commands, all of the decrees, all of the feasts, and all of the sacrifices, everything actually was a foreshadow, was pointing to Jesus Christ. Everything was fully completed in Jesus Christ. And that is why we don't keep any of those feasts and we don't do any more of the sacrifices because everything is fully accomplished in uh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay, so we look at, yes, Nelson. When Jesus uh, said to you can just go ahead and ask your question, doesn't matter. Or you want to ask after some time? We'll continue. Nicodemus. Okay, you go ahead. When Jesus no problem, uh, said to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, hmm. so after that, did he just born again or he, re he repented, ma'am? Sorry? Nicodemus, ah. did he born again or he, he just repented after uh, talking with Jesus? Was, uh, was Nicodemus born again or repented? Yeah, he would have repented of his sins, right? He believed that Jesus was the Messiah. So the thing is, God will judge people based on the, the extent of the revelation of what he has given, what he has revealed to them in their time, in their season. Okay. So we see that even as we are here now in the New Testament church, many years later, we have received greater revelation and everything is built on the ones that have gone uh, you know, before us, okay, so based on what they experience, what they have done, you know, even like for Abraham and all, we can say Abraham has so many wives, even I can marry, you know, but it was depending on their culture, depending on the amount of revelation, what they understood of God, 
they related to God in that sense. But we need to relate to God in the understanding that and the full revelation that we have received now. Right? So yes, Nicodemus, if he had repented, he would have been born again. Born again in the sense we're not talking about the terminology that we use now for believing in, in Jesus, but like the others who had repented of their sins. Okay. So Abhishek is put Romans chapter 2 verse 12 says, For all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law. All who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So yes, Paul is writing to the church at Rome and he's saying, Hey, you Jews, uh, you know, you will be judged by the law. You have no excuse. And you uh, Gentiles, you cannot say we don't have the law. We didn't have the covenants. God has not given us the law and the covenants. So he cannot judge us. Okay. But God is saying, I can judge you because... I have given you an inbuilt law. What is that inbuilt law? It's your conscience. So the conscience, he says, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, is your inbuilt law. And your conscience is something that will correct you, that tells you that you have sinned and gone against God. So you have no excuse. Jews have no excuse. They have the law. The Gentiles also have no excuse because they have their conscience. And in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, hey, you have no excuse because... The invisible attributes of God, his eternal power, the Godhead, has been revealed through nature. Okay? So you can't say, hey, we didn't have the Torah, we didn't have the, uh, the priests and the trying to teach us the law. You have no excuse because nature itself reveals the invisible attributes of God. Nature itself reveals the Godhead, the power of God. So you have no excuse that we cannot, no one has the excuse to say that, we don't know who God is, right? Because nature itself manifests the uh, invisible attributes of God. That is Romans chapter 1. Thank you, Abhishek. Okay, so Jesus takes threefold approach in introducing the kingdom. So let's look at what are the three things that Jesus did that we can also incorporate even as we extend the kingdom of God here on earth. So can somebody please read Matthew chapter 4, verses 17 and verse 23. Can I Matthew read, sister? Yes, sister, get truth. Please go ahead. Yeah. Matthew chapter 4, verses 17 and 23. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Sister, no volume, sister. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so how did Jesus uh, introduce the kingdom? What are the three things that he did? The first one, preaching the good news of the kingdom. Second one, teaching the principles of the kingdom. Third one, he went about healing and, dem and or demonstrating, doing signs, miracles and wonders. And hence he demonstrated the kingdom. Okay. So that we also re we also see repeated the same thing in Matthew chapter 9 verse. 35, where we see that Jesus went about all cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease that was among the people. So Jesus, to sum up, this is how he introduced the kingdom, preaching, teaching, and healing. By healing, you demonstrated the kingdom of God. Okay. So you and I have this privilege, you and I have this responsibility to see the kingdom of God being advanced in our midst. And you and I are also called to do the same thing. What are we called to do? <laughs> same. Well, preach the good news of the kingdom of God. Second one. Teaching the principles of the kingdom. And then healing, healing power of God and thus demonstrating the kingdom of God. Okay. So we see that he preached, he taught. We look at some of the things that Jesus taught. 
And whatever he taught, what was the end result of the teachings of the kingdom of God that Jesus brought to the people or what he taught to the people, what was the end result? They repented, they, trans they were thinking was transformed and they began to live the kingdom lifestyle. Okay, so we look at a few things here. We will study more about the teachings of the kingdom of God by Jesus. But here we look at a few things. The first one is poor in spirit. Okay, uh, Matthew chapter 5 verse 3, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is the meaning to be poor? Oh, okay, here is humble, but poor basically means deprived of something, to be in a state where you need something, you want something, you're asking for more or you're begging. So to be poor in spirit is to be needy in the spirit. Okay, It means to be hungry in your spirit, man, for more of God. So there's a hunger, an unquenchable thirst, a continuous state of wanting, of begging, of crying out, for what you do not have in your spirit, okay? And you're always crying out for more of God. You're needing more of God, is, and it is a good thing. Why is it a good thing? Why is it a good thing to hunger and be in a continuous state of wanting, crying out for more of God? Yes, you will be filled with more of God, and you will experience more of His power, his glory, who he is, okay, you'll experience this and you'll also experience the kingdom of God and you are blessed because it says blessed are the poor in spirit and those who are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of God, okay, so if you are a man or woman hungering for more of God, you're going to experience this, you're experiencing the blessing of God, you're experiencing his kingdom inside you. The second one is persecuted for doing right. Okay. Uh, same Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5 verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for what? For righteousness sake. That means what? Not when you're persecuted for doing wrong, when you're persecuted for doing right. And what does it say? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay. So when you are persecuted, you're wrongly judged and mistreated for doing what is right. Just remember that the kingdom of heaven is yours. Okay? And the glory of God shall be revealed in you and through you both even as you're living here on this earth and in the life to come. Because his kingdom far outweighs the light and the afflictions that we are suffering momentarily. Okay? His kingdom far outweighs all of the afflictions and the momentary sufferings that we are going through, like we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. So Jesus goes on to teach the people of the kingdom of God. He said, you know, you want to be a hot shot in the kingdom of God, I tell you what to do. Okay, so what does Jesus say? Look at what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Can somebody read that? Yes, Komal, you can read it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called the great in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. So what is Jesus saying here? What is Jesus saying here? Whoever, okay, ah, somebody who is teaching and not keeping the word themselves, they're breaking the law and the commandment themselves, okay, they will not be great in the kingdom of heaven, but who will be great in the kingdom of heaven? Those who practice and then teach. Okay, so this is the kingdom of God. It's not about possessions you have or the position that you hold. But if you do, you know, what is just 
what God wants you to do, and then you teach others to the same, he will give you a good place. Okay? So there are a few occasions when Jesus described what le leads to the greatness in the kingdom. And this is one of the places. In other places, he teaches them that if they want to become great in the, in the kingdom of God, they have to become like little children. Yes, they should become childlike. That means they need to humble themselves like little children in their relationship with God as their father. And that would make them great in the kingdom of God. We read that in Matthew chapter 18, verse 4. He also says that if we humble ourselves to become like a servant, you know, to others, that would bring us to the place of greatness in the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 20, verse 26. Okay. So here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, what we read, Jesus instructs us that if we do his word personally in our lives, live by it, follow it, and then teach others to live by the word. It leads us to stature and honor in the kingdom. Okay? Notice that doing precedes, doing precedes teaching. Yes. First, we live it out in our own lives. Then we share it with others. Uh, how we need to live God's word, how we need to live God's commandments, and help them to live out the word in their lives as well. Okay. Now, when Jesus went on to say, listen, look at the Pharisees. You know, they are these kind of people that you shouldn't be like. What does he say in, in verse 20 of that same chapter? What does he say in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20? He says, you shouldn't be like the Pharisees. And what are the kind of people you shouldn't be like? Look at verse 20. He said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. Right? So that means God is not just looking for people who know his word, just, you know, and teaching and doing mighty ministry, uh, work in his kingdom but he's looking for people who are righteous, right before God. That means obedient before God. Okay. So he teaches more about the kingdom of God. We look at what Jesus talks about prayer and, and pray about the kingdom when he says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 10 to 13. Can somebody read that, please? Matthew 6, 10 to 13. Matthew 6, 10 and 13. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So Jesus says, when you finish praying, what should you do? Acknowledge the king, right? Acknowledge the king. Say, thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Okay? We're saying, God, I acknowledge you as the sovereign king, as the sovereign lord, the omnipotent one over all this universe, the ruler whom nobody can question or challenge. Okay? Another aspect that Jesus teaches about the kingdom in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Very famous, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Anyone knows? Seek ye first the and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Okay? So what is Jesus saying here? He's saying, hey, you need to know about your priorities. Okay, so he's saying, listen, here's what your priorities should be. What is your number one priority? Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. So let the kingdom of God begin to affect your priorities. What you think is important in life should be affected by the kingdom of God. So seek first his kingdom and then what? Your eating, your drinking, your sleeping, your career, your needs, your clothes, everything else will be taken care of. Amen? Okay. The next thing we, uh, Jesus taught about the kingdom, we read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Can somebody read that, please? Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who 
does the will of my father in heaven yes so what is jesus emphasizing here about the kingdom is doing the will of god rather than mere lip service right that is what the pharisees and sadducees were doing mere lip service okay but he's emphasizing that it's important to do the will of god okay so he even revealed that knowing him personally is more important than being familiar with just using his name or supposedly ministering in his name i'll say that again okay jesus is stressing here that is more important for him to know him more personally that is more important than being just familiar with the mechanics of using his name or supposedly just ministering in his name okay we can just minister in jesus name we can use his name mightily but jesus is more interested in how much intimately you are relating with him okay that is more important how much you know him personally so like jesus talked about the kingdom you know his uh, when he taught about the kingdom his teaching basically challenged the thinking of the people and their way of living okay that is how he introduced or reintroduced the kingdom here on earth we also see that jesus demonstrated the kingdom how did he demonstrate the kingdom the healing yes okay so we look at um, various scripture passages where he went and he healed all who were brought to him all who were sick were brought to him jesus healed them all he cast out de devils he delivered people and he says this is the kingdom okay so look at what he says in matthew chapter 12 verse 28 what does jesus say read 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 matthew chapter 12 verse 28 graham you can also read but but if a coast out devils by the spirits of god then the kingdom of god is come into you yeah so jesus saying if i cast out devils by the spirit then this is a sign the kingdom of god is here okay so he's saying this is me assuring the kingdom how am i assuring the kingdom by casting out devils by healing the sick that is what jesus said so he demonstrated the power of the kingdom and that is how he you know uh, inaugurated the kingdom into this world and he taught the disciples to do the same look at what jesus said in matthew chapter 10 verses 7 and 8 what does he tell this uh, his disciples give it to asapu let him read matthew chapter 10 verses 7 and 8 and as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is in is at hand heal the sick cleanse the leper raise the dead cast out demons freely you have received freely give amen so jesus is saying hey i want you to as you go and preach the king about the kingdom i want you to say the kingdom of god is at or the kingdom of heaven is at hand what is the meaning of at hand it's near it's there it's something tangible that you can reach okay and what should you do heal the sick cleanse the lepers raise the dead and cast out demons freely you have given this freely you have received freely you give okay so that is what jesus taught about the kingdom that is what he preached he taught and that is how he demonstrated the kingdom through healing okay so here's the challenge sorry so here's a challenge um sorry i lost myself yeah so here's a challenge i want to put forward to us you know you and i are responsible to see the kingdom of god extended here on the earth and how are you going to extend god's kingdom here on earth preaching teaching and healing just like jesus did so announce the good news announce the good news preach the good news of the kingdom 
some of us don't like the word preach. So I would say you can share, speak, you know, tell the people about the king and the kingdom, teach people about the king and the kingdom, and demonstrate the kingdom of God. This is a method that Jesus used and is the same method that you and I can use to advance the kingdom of God. So some of you are saying, hey, I inherited the kingdom of God. Now what do I do next? So you know what to do next, right? What do you do? Preach, heal. teach, and teach. Heal. heal. Okay. Is it easy to heal? <laughs> yes, in the name of Jesus. And also it's easy to heal. Why? Because the king of the kingdom. Yes. And what did we learn about his names? That his name is wonderful. And as wonderful, he is the miraculous and he wants the miraculous to invade every part of his kingdom and so you're saying god i want to do all of these three things including healing and i know that's possible because you are the king of the kingdom you're mighty god and also you are wonderful you're miraculous you want your kingdom to be saturated with the miraculous amen yes so pray that believe that and go and heal the sick and also raise the dead. Amen? Okay. So all of you are going to become powerful kingdom builders. Amen to that. All of us. Yes. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Amen, Lucy. Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? Okay. okay, if there are no questions, we will move on to chapter 3. Okay. Uh, the church and the kingdom. Okay, chapter 3. So in chapter 3, we're basically going to look at what part does the church have in the kingdom of God. And we're also going to look at what is the relationship between the church and the kingdom. Okay. Now, we must understand that the church is part of the overall kingdom of God at this present time. The church is basically in this present time, this present season, the church is a representation of the kingdom of God here on the earth. So when we are talking about church, what do we mean? A building? People, yes, we're talking about us, believers, saints, okay, each one of us, okay. And the Lord Jesus Christ has vested in the church the authority of the kingdom. Remember last class we learned how Jesus, when he died on the cross, he took back the keys of authority, dominion that Adam and Eve had given to Satan, dominion of the earth. He took it back and he's given the keys of authority to whom? The church. Okay, so the church has been vested uh, with the authority of the kingdom. So let's look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 to 19. What does Jesus say? Can somebody else please read that? Yes, John, bless you. Read. And I also say to you that you are a Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hate shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen. So Peter had just proclaimed that Jesus is whom? Jesus asks, who do you say I am? He says that you are Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus is saying, Peter, on this truth that Christ is the son of the living God, I am going to build my church. I'm going to establish my church. And what is this church going to do? Look at your Bibles. What is the church going to do? What is the church going to do? The church will overthrow the powers of hell. Why will the church overthrow the powers of hell? Yes. Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
Why does Jesus say, I will give you? Why doesn't he say, you have been given the keys of the kingdom? <laughs> Listen to my question again. Why does Jesus say, I will give you? And why doesn't he say, I have given you? Yes, one, he's not yet died on the cross. He's not yet taken the punishment for our sins. He's not taken back the authority. So he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said he would build his church and the gates of hell will not overpower the church. Okay. Now, what is the meaning of gates here? In the Old Testament, the city gates were places where the rulers sat and passed their judgments. Okay. It was also a place of control and protection. Who comes into the city? Who is allowed to come into the city? Who is not allowed to come into the city? Like nowadays in the apartment complexes, you know, everyone has to enter the name, the son, they'll call and say visitors come, blah, 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 you know. So the same way in the uh, ancient cities, okay. It was a place of, gates were a place of protection and control, okay. So whoever controlled the city gates actually controlled the people who were coming inside the city, who accessed to come into the city and who were exiting the city. So it also represented the seat of power because, you know, many of them, uh, would sit down there and would pass their judgments, the elders. Now here it talks about the gates of hell. What is the meaning of gates of hell? I said what gates represent, right? So what is the meaning of gates of hell? The powers of hell, yes. So Jesus is saying the powers of hell cannot stop the church. Amen? Yes. So yesterday's question on revival, the powers of Hell cannot stop the church even when God brings about the revival. Now, gates, do the gates move? No, gates are stationary, right? They don't move. Gates don't move. So, also, here we know that the church has to advance against the gates of hell. So, the, the church doesn't just sit around, you know, waiting for the powers to, of hell to come and attack them. But the church should not be doing that. In essence, the church that Jesus is building is the church that goes against the powers of hell. That means the church that confronts and that overthrows the power of hell. Are you all able to understand? Yes? So, so, so Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, which means keys means authority. So Jesus said he has the keys of hell and Death, Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. What is the meaning that when Jesus said he has the keys of hell and death? He's basically meaning that he has conquered them and therefore he has authority over hell and death. So the church has been given the authority of the kingdom of heaven to do what? Look at your verse that we read. The church has the authority of the kingdom of heaven to do what? To bind, to, be, to bind on earth what is bound in heaven, to lose on earth what is loosed in heaven. What does that mean? Okay, we have the authority to bind anything. What does it mean? To bind on earth what is bound in heaven, to lose on earth what is to lose in heaven. What does it mean? I already said this. Whatever is not permitted in heaven, we don't permit it here. We bind it here. Whatever is permitted in heaven, whatever has happened in heaven, we release that here on the earth. Amen? So the church is to bring the heaven on earth. So church is part of the kingdom of God here on the earth. And church are those who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And we have been given the authority of the kingdom to overthrow what the devil is doing and to usher in the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Are you excited that you are here on earth to bring what is in heaven here on earth? That means you bring whatever is in heaven in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your relationships, in your job places, in your ministry. Whatever is not of God, you bind it. Whatever of God is there, you release that here on 
earth into your life and in the sphere of influence that God has given you. Amen. Okay, we'll stop here. Any questions? Online students, any questions? No questions? Online students have been very quiet today. Okay, anyway, thank you all for your participation. Um, have a wonderful day. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Warren.